just sort of steam on it. <laughs> <laughs> solidifying. <laughs> 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 meeting to order please uh, we are at the city of moorhead planning commission and board of adjustments and could we have a roll call please jim haney present nicole matson present joel paulson here ben hammer here okay can i get a motion to approve the agenda so moved. it's all second any discussion all those in favor please signify by saying yes Yes. 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 Whatever. Right. <laughs> all those in, all those opposed, please say no. And the motion passes. Well, whatever you would like, you're the chair. My feeling is we're not pirates, okay. and in America we say yes. All right. We'll use yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I? Let, okay. Before we approve the minutes, wait. Okay. So I have an actual. I have a small change to the minutes. Um, do I have to make that? Do I make that now or do we? Okay. I'm, I'm the, the on um, public hearing item number one, where it says chair brief commissioners on the request of the applicant. I am pretty confident that I did not do that. So if you could please I make know. that change right. to staff. Other than that, is there, does anyone else have any other changes to the minutes? Nope. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? A move to approve the minutes. Nope. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. And the motion or the minutes are approved. Are there any citizens to be heard on any issues that are not on the agenda? It would not appear to be the case. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a presentation of the draft 12th Avenue South Corridor Study Report. Thank you, Chair Matson. Uh, Matt Kinsella of Apex Engineering Group is here tonight to present you the draft report of the 12th Avenue South Corridor study, and he would be happy to answer any questions following his presentation. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Commissioners. Good evening, and appreciate the opportunity to present this study or a kind of the executive summary of the study the, uh, to you to you tonight. This will probably take about 15 minutes or so, and. Like Robin said, we can certainly answer any questions afterwards when we're done. And I think in your packet, you do have a copy of the executive summary. It's in draft form, and this presentation, uh, the information is still in draft form as well, just to be clear about that. <clears throat> Before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge our study review committee. We had a great team on this project made up of a lot of different agencies and uh, people, as you can see. Did want to point out and, and thank the City of Moorhead staff. Uh, everyone was fantastic. Christy did a great job for us being very responsive, and, and Tom and John and, and Steve as well came to all the meetings, so we really appreciate the engagement and the involvement from the Moorhead staff on the project, on the study, I should say. Uh, so let's get started. Just a quick overview on the study area. We're looking at 12th Avenue South here from 
River Drive to Main Avenue Southeast. So it's about two miles of 12th Avenue South. Uh, really an interesting corridor goes through, as you can see, quite a bit of residential areas, but we have the institutional use as well with Concordia and MSUM not too far to the north. And then we have the industrial park on the, on the east end as well. So we had a lot of different elements and issues to balance with this study. So why did this study start or why was it needed? Um, the city did a, a nice job here of recognizing that, um, hey, we've got a 2020 programmed mill and overlay and rehab project. So a couple years before that, we stepped back and said, let's take a look at this and is there anything that, we, that might come out of this study that we could tag onto that project and take the opportunity when we're in you know, disrupting the corridor with construction to try to address some of those issues. So that's really the main, the main need for the study. In addition to that, we want to identify any long range issues that might need to be addressed out in the future and try to flag those now for, for future reference. And the time frame for the study, we did start about a year ago uh, in May, and we're just wrapping up now, as I mentioned. So one of the first things we looked at with the study was the traffic analysis, and I just wanted to hit on a few highlights for you. Um, starting with the capacity, is, is what's out there now, can that handle the traffic both now and in the future? And what, what's out there now, as, as you're probably familiar with, is primarily a two-lane section. You've got some parking in some areas. There is a three-lane section. Uh, to the east in the industrial park, but we really were kind of focusing on the two-lane section. And uh, what we did find is that yes, the, the answer is yes, what's out there now can handle that traffic, both the existing 2018 traffic and the 2040 traffic, which was our projection, kind of our target year for the study. Uh, so we really didn't see a need to expand the capacity as far as widening or adding lanes in that sense. Uh, also took a look at crash history over the last five years. Uh, while there are crashes, we didn't flag any issues in particular, anything that would be above what would be considered any critical crash rates or anything like that. Uh, so then we, then we looked at delay and backups, you know, really, and mostly in, at the intersections, trying to focus if there's any problem areas there. What we found is that there's really acceptable delay at, at all the intersections, both in existing and 2040, uh, except for 8th Street. We did start to see some problems, which isn't any surprise there, I'm sure. Primarily, the eastbound movement is, is where we saw the problem, which was kind of interesting. Uh, and that was both in existing conditions and in 2040. And then when you, when you look at 2040, we really start to see queuing or backup problems where that traffic, eastbound traffic, both the through and left turn movements are starting to back up fairly substantially. So we flagged that as, as something that we needed to look at in our alternative development to see how we could maybe address that in the future. <clears throat> I wanted to spend a little time highlighting our public involvement process, which I think was a real highlight of this study. Um, just go through some of the elements that we, that we did include. We had a public participation plan, an actual document put together by our, our subconsultant Flint Group, and they did a really nice job putting that together. And then that was really the umbrella that, that went over the top of everything we did in public involvement. So it really gave our, our study review committee a lot of guidance for how we wanted to handle public meetings, how we wanted to handle social media, uh, websites and, and surveys and things like that. Speaking of the public input meetings, we did have two, uh, in, two public input meetings. You can see the dates uh, on the screen. We did have good attendance at those. Uh, you can see that uh, the second one in particular, we got 40 people to come to that meeting, which for public meetings, especially in the planning stages, is, is pretty good in my experience. Uh, and we did do formal presentations at those as well, which I think were, were well received. The real crown jewel of our public involvement process on this study was the online surveys that we did. We did two online surveys. The first one you can see was back uh, July, kind of the middle of last year, when we were really in the early to middle stages of the study, and, we were, and that was a pretty open survey. It really just kind of asked, what, what do you see? You know, how do you use the corridor? What are some of the problems you see on the corridor? And we got 172 responses, which is fantastic. I've, I've personally never seen anything like that on a study or project that I've worked on. Uh, so th that really worked well. And we did a second one here in March and April, which was a little bit, um, a little bit harder survey to do. It was, we were asking them to kind of react to some of the alternatives, and some of that's hard to do, um, just looking at the alternatives, some exhibits on the screen. So uh, understandably, we probably didn't get as many responses there, but still 
not too bad at, at 26. So uh, with that, I guess that out of, out of the study review committee's discussions, out of the public meetings, the surveys, a lot of different things were, were really commonly, common categories that, that bubbled to the surface, so we just wanted to touch on a few of those. Number one, or one of the number one things, and actually before I get into this, I did want to mention too that um, pavement condition was, was a, a very highly commented on item. And I don't want it to seem like we're ignoring the pavement condition, but because that project is already programmed to, to do the mill and overlay and, and the rehab, uh, we really focused on some of the other you know, things that could be added on to that. So we're not ignoring the pavement condition. That was definitely commented on uh, from the public involvement process. So one thing that, that was a big, big deal to people was pedestrian and bicycle connectivity. There's a lot of gaps out on the corridor right now. There's some areas that don't have off-street sidewalks or pedestrian or bike facilities. Um, and, the, and there was a desire for people to have more of that and really and continue to build the network connectivity. Some of the residential neighborhoods that are east of Maine, you know, they're, uh, they have kids that are, that are coming through that industrial park area, maybe trying to get to the pool um, area at the parks. And, and so we did get a lot of comments about that uh, as well. And then with the BNSF crossing right now, as you know, there's no, there's no way for a pedestrian or cyclist to get across that crossing unless you actually use the road part of the crossing. So that was something that we paid attention to. A little bit more about that crossing in addition to that issue. Uh, there, there's just some things going on there that I think everyone's familiar with. You've got some significant grade differences between the, the intersection at 20th and the tracks. There's some steep cross slopes. You can see that bus tipped quite a bit as it's just sitting there, which in the winter can create some, some safety issues when buses are stopped at the tracks if there's ice and snow present. Uh, so there's just some things we wanted to look at, the, at that intersection, and we definitely heard that back as well from the public during the, the surveys. <clears throat> this corridor is, is a heavily used transit corridor. There's three routes that use the corridor. There's a number of stops. Uh, these two stops in particular uh, really had heavy usage. The one at 25th Street, uh, you have a place for hope right there, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, users that, that have used the transit to get to and from that. And right now, as you can see in the photo, uh, they, there's no accessible way to get down and get onto the bus. That, that's actually a driveway, so they use the driveway as an effective curb ramp um, for an accessible, accessible uh, access to, to the bus stop there. When we look at these corridors, we also take, we like to take a look at, at access and driveways and see if there's any opportunities to improve or restrict access or consolidate access to just help the operations of the corridor. Um, it's hard with a corridor like this that ha is, is so residential in nature. Obviously, you can't just close driveways. But there were some opportunities that we did look at to do that. <clears throat> And finally, we, uh, we really took a close look at um, corridor aesthetics as well, streetscaping, landscaping, trees. We heard back from the, the process that preservation of the existing trees on the corridor is, was really important to people. Um, it's a mature corridor, obviously, with some really nice trees. You have the, what we call the crazy tree on Concordia campus uh, that's, that's really a landmark and very sacred to, to a lot of people in that area. So, uh, this was something we heard as well and, and that we built into our, our process. In addition to that, the, the city has been doing a really nice job of incorporating art where it's possible in some of the in infrastructure projects. Uh, some examples here of, of utility box art or, or sidewalk stamping. So that was something that we, we kind of put in front of the public too to just get some reaction on. So with all those issues, we ended up developing a number of alternatives and eventually fleshed those out to some recommended improvements. Um, and I'll just kind of spin through them. I'm not going to touch on everything here. There's, um, there's kind of a laundry list of different things that could get tagged on to that 2020 project. And that'll be something that'll still, the discussion will continue and be decided during final design, I'm sure, between, between this commission and city council and, and staff. Um, but as you're looking at these, the ones that, that have the green flags were ones that essentially were recommended by the study review committee. Um, there's a few that have red flags that were considered but ultimately not recommended. Uh, and I think you have these in your, in your packet too if you need a little bit closer look because I recognize that it's a little bit hard to, 
to see on the screen. But just to kind of go through segment by segment and, and I'll, I'll highlight a few of the um, improvements that we think have that, that uh, are a little bit more of high, high profile or get a little bit more bang for the buck on. Um, so from River Drive to 8th Street, a couple of the things we're doing here is uh, from 5th Street to 8th Street on the south side, we're going to look at widening that sidewalk to more of a path. Uh, like a shared use path so that that can start to be part of that path network that we continue or the ability to continue you know, some of that connectivity to the east. And we worked with Concordia on that. They are definitely receptive to that. They own, on the block there from 5th to 6th, they own those properties on the south side so they're willing to, to work with the city on trying to widen that sidewalk in that area. Um, so that was one of the things we looked at there. In addition to a, a few other things, driveway changes and and some shifting of the pullouts there for Concordia. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about 8th Street since we, we flagged that as an issue earlier. <clears throat> so the current, the current configuration of 8th Street on that eastbound leg, you can see here the area that I've circled in red. Uh, there's, two, there's a two-lane approach if you're going east, and right now the right lane is a shared through right lane, so both of those movements share that lane and the left lane is left turn only. Um, so we looked really hard at, at this intersection and a number of different ideas to try to address that eastbound queuing issue that I mentioned earlier in the future. Ultimately what the study review committee decided is to leave this the way it is right now, but we are going to make a few geometric changes with this 2020 project or recommend that they're made um, with the curb and gutter in order to kind of tee this up for a, for a change in the future that would look like this. So essentially still the two lane approach but we would swap that through movement over to the left lane so now it would be a, a shared through left instead of a shared through right. And actually this really does um, operate a lot better when I, we ran it through the traffic analysis. Uh, in order to do that, like I mentioned, we, you can see there's some curb shifting on both the east and west side that we would look at doing. And again, the recommendation is not to, to make this restriping change now but to monitor the condition and, and eventually in the future we think it probably will need to be made at some point. <clears throat> so moving on to uh, the next segment, 8th Street to 20th Street, uh, a couple of the things that we're, we're doing here, again looking at the, the bike path, we're continuing that bike path on the south side. Right now there's no facility on the south side there from 8th to 11th on the Concordia or kind of adjacent to Concordia's property. So again, they were really willing to work with us to get a, a really nice size, hopefully a full size bike path in there from 8th to 11th. So that will complete that path all the way from 5th to 11th Street on the south side. And then continuing to the east, at that point it does get prohibitive both probably from a cost and an impact standpoint to try to, to widen that sidewalk on the south side. So we're proposing to move the bike lanes onto the street at that point and do two bike lanes, two six foot bike lanes eliminate the parking through that stretch and, and run, them, uh, run the bikes through that way. <clears throat> and then looking at 20th Street, again we mentioned that uh, some of the issues there, we looked at a possible grade raise or raising that intersection up to mitigate some of those issues with the railroad tracks. And it, it can be done, it's um, obviously a little bit more costly, but we're recommending that as a future, more of a long range improvement, not something that would be done with this project, but something that the city will want to keep in mind for the future. And then the final segment, 20th Street to Main Avenue through the industrial park. A couple things there we, we want to look at, installing some sort of a crossing there across the railroad tracks, a sidewalk or, or path that can be used by pedestrians and bicycles. Um, in addition to that, we would continue that path on the south side again, get that off street facility on the south side uh, through this whole stretch and that connects up nicely with the one as you go east uh, at Main Street as well, or at Main Avenue as well. So um, really, really does help the connectivity, overall network connectivity of that pedestrian and bike facility. And then we, we looked at a number of corridor wide I guess ideas almost again like an a la carte menu of, of uh, landscaping and streetscaping ideas that you can look at. I just focused in on a couple here just for your reference at 7th Street and, and 8th Street on the Concordia campus. You can see there's some ideas about um, with street paving, 
colored crosswalks, uh, some accent paving that can be done, benches and you know, creating plazas and different things and then using trees and shrubs also to, to accent that. So uh, we had a lot of good ideas with this and Concordia was really walked alongside us the whole way and I think they're definitely interested in this as well and I think they have expressed an interest in, in possibly contributing to uh, the funding of that you know, when, it's, when it's on their campus. Okay, just a couple more slides here and then I can take any questions. Just to touch on some of the cost, cost information related to all this. Um, so starting with that base project, again I mentioned there's a programmed 2020 project that has federal funding that the city has planned. Uh, and that project includes some of the things I've listed here, the mill and overlay up to 20th Street, a pavement replacement east of 20th Street, and some other incidental things you know, that would go along with that. Uh, right now I think that's programmed into the CIP at about three and a half million dollars at this point. So that would be the kind of the base project. And then in addition to that, um, I, we just highlighted some of those improvements. And there's a number of them on the list, but I've rolled them up into some different categories here just for just kind of an overview. So you can see the short-term recommended improvements falling in some of those different categories, bike ped, parking and access, uh, some traffic operation things, um, and then the landscaping. And with the landscaping, I should point out that almost half of that $400,000 is, is decorative street lighting, if that's the direction that the city wanted to go. So um, those other improvements that, uh, you know, are, are not quite as expensive, but the street lighting definitely raises the cost. And then you see some of the long-term things that we mentioned as well as far as the grade raise. And, and uh, we did talk to MPS also about possibly burying the power lines, the overhead power lines. That's a preliminary cost estimate to do that. And so those discussions, of course, would, would continue as well. And these are planning level estimates and, and in current dollars as well. So the last thing I wanted to mention too is that there is a concurrent study going on on US 10 and 75 uh, at, right, at, right at this time that we overlap uh, at 8th Street, essentially the two studies, we share that intersection. And just wanted to, to mention that we have coordinated quite a bit with that study team. Um, I think a lot of the, our members of our study review committee were on that one as well, so that really helped. Uh, they are using 2045 projections where we use 2040. That was really one of the main differences. But ultimately, they're going to refer to our recommendations from this study at 8th Street uh, for whatever is decided there. That's all I have, and I thank you again for your time, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and also your team's work on this. This is really thorough, and I really appreciate it. Um, before um, we get to questions, there was just one um, thing I wanted to note for anybody who might be listening along at home. Um, my understanding of the population projections for the metro area is that between 2015 and 2045, we're looking at somewhere between a 42 and 50 percent increase in population. Um, based, I think that was a MetroCog study from a few years ago. Um, and so I was actually surprised to learn at, at the public information session that you had uh, in March that the 12th Avenue corridor will be, will be able to handle that great of an increase in traffic and it, it did show on the mm -hmm. on your slide what the what the numbers were but um but just for people that are following along at home you know if if we do all of this stuff it it'll it should la it should last us a pretty long time based mm -hmm. on what 12th avenue can handle in terms of traffic without having to be changed is that a fair statement yes that that's what the traffic analysis showed as as you mentioned you know it definitely did increase as you could see uh, with those numbers and it's starting to approach that capacity or that planning level capacity for a for a two-lane facility um, but that's that's what the analysis showed thank you anybody have any questions i'm here um, i just have a few questions for you uh, matt if you if you could um, I, I noticed the sidewalk in between second and fourth was uh, not recommended um, mm -hmm. on the north side of 12th. Um, is there any particular reason? I, I mean, it, it seems to me there's a lot of student housing there. There's a lot of people walking the campus that I see on those roads. 
Um, I know we have sidewalk on the one side of the street, um, and maybe this falls uh, in line with the city sidewalk policy. I don't know, but um, you know, it seems to me that might be something that we may want to add to the to the project. Yes, uh, we did. We did have a lot of discussions about that one. That was uh, that was a tough one. I would say working mm -hmm. with the study review committee. We did get feedback on that from the public, you know, the, particularly the people that live in those areas. Uh, that was something that they, um, they really wanted. I think when we looked at it, it was one of those where the, um, the impacts, because it hasn't been there for so long as far as utility poles, um, you know, private, whatever it is, trees or different things that, that people have erected over there over the years, you know, that because those sidewalks haven't been there. There was quite a bit more impacts when we looked at trying to get that sidewalk in um, that ultimately, uh, from a cost and impact standpoint, the SRC decided that uh, they, didn't, they wouldn't recommend that. Okay. Um, I guess the other thing that uh, I just wanted to get a little more information about uh, some of these driveways uh, into the Concordia parking lots. Mm -hmm. are, are they completely on board with closing those those driveways? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, the other comment I would have. Uh, would be was there coordination with um, the residents in between uh, 11th and 20th as far as losing the parking on 12th Avenue? Well, as far as coordination, we presented it uh, at the second public meeting, and also I guess showed it in the survey you know that was out that that people could comment on, and. If I remember right, at, at the second public meeting, there, there were a few people that had some concerns with it. We also got comments, too, that you know, they liked the idea of putting the bike lanes in. If we couldn't get an off-street bike path in, they liked the idea of, of putting the bike lanes in. Um, I think, and we, we did look at the, more, the parking study, I think you guys did, as a city, about four or five years ago. If I remember right, I think there was, the utilization was pretty low on that parking once you got east of 11th Street. So I think that was factored in as well by the study review committee in that decision. Were there any, so you mentioned there were some negative comments though as far as losing that parking? There was at least one that I can remember. It's possible there was more than that. Okay, okay, sure. And uh, the, there really was no opportunity to add a shared use path off, off the street to, to provide um, uh, bike facilities through there? Well, there, there is, you can do it, and I think we have it in there. I forget what the alternative name is on it, but it was, it's one of those shown in red. Sure. Um, and again, it's, it's just cost and, and impact. And you know, impact. We, did, we did hear, obviously, the boulevard trees. That's you know, completely residential through that area, and I think we, would, we ended up wiping out or expecting to wipe out a number of those boulevard trees in doing that. So weighing all of those, all of those issues it seemed like uh, getting, you know, doing the bike lanes was the preferred option, at least for the study review committee. Yeah, it, and I personally like the bike lanes, and I like how you've maintained continuity for um, bicycle uh, traffic throughout the corridor. Um, it's just it's something we struggle with all the time, is in loss of parking and and uh, and the sidewalk issue before or prior. Right. Um, the only other comment, um, you know, I would have at this time. Uh, I know you discussed the quiet zone just briefly at mm -hmm. 20th Street, um, but uh, I'm certain that's something that we'd want to look at um, as we're doing the project in, in 2020 um, and, and how we can incorporate that quiet zone into any sort of improvements that are, that are taking place there, or at least put elements that would allow a quiet zone project in the future with minimal impacts um, to the project after it's complete, I guess. So I'm sure you, yes. you've addressed it more in depth in the report. Uh, you know, I just wanted to make a comment to that effect, and uh, that's all I have. So okay. thank you. Thank you. I did have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, number one, 
there was some <coughs> conversation, um, I believe it was that, at that public hearing on the 12th Avenue corridor about the um, uh, crossing signals at 8th and 12th for at the Concordia intersection um, and the no right turn on red signs that live there all of the time mm -hmm. um, and whether or not those could be made digital so they could at least be turned off when there are no students in uh, on campus um, was, was there any further um, discussion on that or any resolution on that issue Yes, that was an item that, that was talked about. And, I, and there's definitely interest in doing that, replacing the, you know, just the static signs, which eventually the compliance, you know, starts to drop on those with the digital ones that, you know, turn on and off and have better compliance. Um, and uh, I, I don't, yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to check back to see where we landed with that. But I think there was interest. I know John was very interested in, in doing something like that as part of what we're doing at 8th Street. Okay. And then the other question that I had was on the um, burying of the power, power lines. If that is not done in, as part of this project, would that increase the cost of, would the cost of doing it later be increased, not just over you know, the inflation, but having to make other changes that, or disrupt things that maybe are gonna be already under construction with this project? Yes, I think it would. Uh, you know, there's always, when you can do something in conjunction with a project that's already disturbing, particularly where we're putting in bike paths and things like that, that, um, you know, you don't want to have to go back into those areas and, and try to disturb that again. So I don't know that that was looked at in too much detail. Uh, we just, we coordinated with them and got a, a cost estimate. And I know the discussion was more about how it would be funded um, if, if it happened. So... Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to our public hearing. We are going to have a public hearing on the request of the City of Moorhead for text amendments to Title 10 and Title 11 of the Moorhead City Code relating to churches, religious institutions, and group assembly in residential, commercial, and light industrial districts. Can I get a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. All second. Any discussion? All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Uh, Robin, can we get some background information? Thank you, Chair Matson. Uh, this item has been looked at because um, there, we discovered some inconsistencies in our uh, use table for the treatment of religious and group assembly uses in residential and commercial districts. Um, what happened was a church called and they were looking to relocate into an existing um, commercial area and we checked the zoning and the use table um, and for some reason under RC churches were not permitted. And we thought that maybe that was just a Scrivener's error oversight. So we looked into it a little further and we found some other inconsistencies for um, like churches um, were also not permitted and maybe like light industrial. And then church uses are also very similar to group assembly. They're supposed to be treated the same. Um, and if you read the code, the, the use table, if you looked in the residential section, it said one thing. And then if you go to the commercial section, said another thing so like if one planner looked it up and repeated you know when we get a phone call what it said in the residential um, they would give a different answer if the, uh, another planner was looking at the commercial section so it was just a matter of we're thinking we're going to clean this up and then we got into it a little further and we found that since we were going to update um, the use table there was a lot of court uh, corresponding sections of our zoning code and then there's also one small section in our subdivision ordinance that deals with religious uses um, so we thought it would be a good time to address those as well and that's why there's kind of a scattering of a smattering of different um, sections uh, the proposed changes are on um, pages 20 to 24 of your packet and i tried to um, lay them out as concisely and clear as possible um, please let me know if you have questions, if something's not clear. Um, we are also um, trying to make uh, the city in compliance with 
um, religious freedoms, the Constitution, federal law, and the city attorney is here um, in case you have any questions about those um, types of things. Uh, that includes my comments, but I'd happy to to address any questions. Um, I had a question, and that is, what, uh, how is a membership organization defined as per these uh, proposed changes? Um, thank you, Chair Matson. Uh, membership organizations are like clubs, lodges, like um, fraternal organizations. I'm not, actually it's a good point. I might have to go back and look and see if we actually have a definition in our, um, in our code. Um, that one, it was just, uh, those uses are grouped in with the group assembly and that's why we put them with the public institute or the religious institutions. Um, they're all to be treated the same, but um, I'm, not, I'm not a member of a fraternal organization, so I'm trying to think like Knights of Columbus or, um, you know, the old, I can't think of another one. Right, I'm just trying to determine how narrowly that's defined. It's, because, it's very wide. Okay, it's because, um, like VFW, American Legion, I think. Maybe that's, it depends on what they, what kind of, if they have a bar, those would be different. Right. But I think um, you put general, um, descriptions and if it's not spelled out in the code defined specifically then the zoning administrator has a lot of latitude to kind of define but it was kind of more the clubs the lodges because um, that language the clubs and lodges was in another part of the ordinance and it was probably some carryover language from like an older code so we just thought we would consolidate it and just call it any membership organization that has a charter that's a nonprofit something like that. But we certainly could add that to the list and maybe next time we do a code amendment, if it needs to be defined, we could put a definition in our definition section. I think that might be a valuable thing to do because I think that there are not as many people doing things like lions and elks and Knights of Columbus, but there's lots of people doing other kinds of membership organizations, whether they're, they are paying dues or not. And there's also, um, I can think of a number of nonprofits that would kind of qualify as that and might not know it, that they would be, they would fall under that definition of a membership organization if, we're, mm -hmm. if that's how we're defining it. Sure. So I, I do think it would be worth taking another look at that particular phrasing and what that means. Yep, we can certainly, it doesn't look like it is in our current code, but that's something we can add to the list to further define that. This was a very complicated um, oh. one of the ordinances <laughs> that I've worked on because there's so many things involved, but thank you for pointing that out. We can certainly add that to the list. Um, so I don't see any citizens to be heard. Um, so are there any other questions up here from any commissioners? It's a, it, I will tell you this, it's a little bit hard to follow, but I think I get where you're going. And I think that it makes sense, the, ch the changes make sense. The, what we were, staff was trying to do was be, be proactive and try to, uh, get, again, meet the need of this church that wants to relocate, but also looking forward and trying to be more um, flexible and more open to, you know, there's so many different religious uses out there today, more than just churches. Um, you know, churches, temples, synagogues, instead of listing all of those right. different, because you poss could not possibly list every single kind. Religious institution is, is, it covers the building that they're in, but it also covers the use, it covers their organization um, as just one thing. And it, um, it also opens up our ordinance, every, every type of use like that is permitted as a conditional use. And really, they're permitted conditionally. It's just to look at, you know, making sure they have enough parking for their needs. Otherwise, you know, they're not a con usually not a controversial use unless it's like a big mega church trying to locate in a neighborhood. Um, those can get a little hairy with the parking situations. And I did see there's a parking. There is a yes parking regulation it, in mm -hmm. there. So yeah, we adjusted that a little bit. Okay. Yeah, Joel. Question, Mr. Chair. 
Um, this is just, it's fairly benign, but I noticed um, Good Shepherd was indicated as a cemetery on here. And uh, as far as I know, there isn't a cemetery they with have that a, property. What's here. called a columbarium, which is a Ew. type of cemetery. Okay. And it's, it's a small structure kind of in the middle of their lot. And it's where they, where you can place um, ashes, okay. um, cremains, but it's, and then there's a plaque on the, the structure indicating that that's where that person is. So that is technically a defined cemetery. It's just a different type of cemetery. Um, and I did change the definition of cemetery to be a little more open because there's different, there's columbariums, there's mausoleums, there may be other ones. I didn't get a chance to check with my funeral director friends to see if there were other things that maybe I didn't think of. Um, but we were just, those four were the existing and we wanted to make sure by changing, um, taking that out of the use table and making a cemeteries accessory uses to religious, religious institutions that we weren't creating any non-conformities where I think there was only one cemetery that has land where they could possibly expand and that's in the north part of Moorhead. I mm -hmm. forget which one it is. The Riverside. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, we didn't want it to make it difficult for them to be able to continue, you know, if they wanted to continue sell, selling lots. So that's why we wanted to make sure to do an analysis. And now I know there's only four, you know, there's only four. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Uh, can I get a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Any <clears throat> discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say yes. Yes. All those opposed, please say no. Can I get a motion on this public hearing, which is a real long title? Um, let's see. Can I get a motion to approve? or recommend approval of the proposed text amendments to Title 10 and 11 of the Moorhead City Code of Ordinances to the City Council. Madam Chair, I'll make that, that um, I will move that we um, recommend approval based on um, staff suggestions and um, for the proposed text amendments to Title 10 and 11. Okay, any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving the motion, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, please say no. Motion passes. And the public hearing is over. Any other business? No other business. Uh, development update. Thank you, Chair Matson. Um, this is just a uh, informational item for the commission that staff uh, thought would be a good idea to kind of keep you apprised of the developments that are going on in the city that you don't see because they don't have to come before the before this commission these are um, once somebody submits their building plans planning and zoning reviews the site plan and checks landscaping and so these are the ones that i've done since i started here um, uh, late last year and some of them are under construction i believe AutoZone started uh, grading their lot um, the 814 Center Avenue is well under construction. Um, they actually just submitted last week for their second phase for the, um, the brewery and the apartment upstairs. Um, Eventide's going to be working, um, moving utilities, so that one's going to be going this summer very soon. Uh, and then the other ones are still pretty early because I'm actually still working on the 815 37th Avenue review that's still that's still on my desk so this is just an informational item um, no motion is required this was very helpful thank you for including it please continue I, this is good to know what else is going on that doesn't come before us um, and then there was a planning Minnesota newsletter in our packet as well per the agenda great can I get a motion to adjourn so move. <laughs> Would anybody like to second that motion? Second. All those in favor, please say yes. 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 All those opposed, say no, and let's go home.
going to be used to say 